In the early 90s, the United Kingdom opted for a selection format where one artist sang all competing songs. In 1994, that artist was musical star Frances Ruffell, and as these things usually go, she won a landslide and beat herself with the song Lonely Symphony. In this episode, I will talk to her about that, her Eurovision experience, and of course about the rest of her impressive career. Unfortunately, something happened to my sound during this interview. It seems like my computer chose the headset microphone instead of the real one. I hope you can be forgiving. This is Eurovision Legends, and I'm your obnoxious headpiece, Emma Lövström. Let's go! Welcome to Eurovision Legends, Frances Ruffell. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. How's life treating you these days? I'm okay right now. It's a funny time, as we know, but I'm being very creative. I'm writing a lot. I'm putting out some new music and I'm just using my time to see my family and, and you know, keeping calm. Great. I'm so happy to have you on the show. I know that you're a big favorite among Eurovision fans, and certainly by me. Oh, that's very kind. Thank you. I actually went to Leicester in 2013 to see you play Piaf. Yes, and I've done my best not to stalk you too much since. (laughs) Did you not come and say hello? No, I didn't. Oh, I always like people to come and say hello. (laughs) (laughs) Next time I will. Yeah, next time. To get in a good mood and warm up, I thought we could start off with some quick questions. Are oh, you? Oh no! <laughs> okay, I'll try my best. Best song from United Kingdom in Eurovision. <laughs> Save all your kisses for me. Save all. <laughs> that song is the first single I ever bought. Yeah. Worst song from United Kingdom in Eurovision. <laughs> oh gosh. Oh, I don't know what the worst song is. Um, I actually can't. I, pass. I don't know. Michael Ball from 92 <laughs> or Sonia from 93. Oh, yeah, i got to choose. I yeah. have to choose Sonia then because Michael Ball's my mate, so I can't choose him. <laughs> <laughs> Who should have won Eurovision but didn't? Me. Great answer. <laughs> Who should not have won Eurovision but did? Oh, now, oh, gosh. Oh, I, I, I'm the worst person you could possibly ask. Um, I have to do pass. I wish I had, I wish I could had a cooler friend moment, you know, in the how to be a millionaire. <laughs> <laughs> Who do you want to see participate for the United Kingdom next year besides Engelbert Humperdinck? <laughs> besides him? Who would I like? Oh, that's an interesting question. Oh, I would like, um, hmm, Sting. <laughs> that would be very can you imagine <laughs> who do you not wish to see participate <laughs> who do I not wish to mm, I don't know hang on I'll have to think longer this is going to be a long edit oh pass <laughs> favourite country in Eurovision besides the United Kingdom uh, my favourite is Ireland last question one word about Terry Wogan Ah, oh, bless him he was very funny. I can't, have I got to only say one word? Okay, one word. Hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> that went well. Um, we're going to talk b- more about Terry Wogan, I promise. Ah, uh, that'd be nice. In 1994, you ended up representing the United Kingdom in Dublin. But before we talk about your memories from the host city, I will go back to the pre-selection that was held at the BBC TV studios in London with a lovely Victorian interior, which got my knickers in a twist. And, <laughs> and it was hosted by Terry Wogan. Yes. What are your memories from this pre-selection? Well, I, I was very lucky because I think that most of those songs were really, really good. Um, I, I mean, it was a hard job for me, but a wonderful job because, you know, I'm used to performing a lot. So for me, it was like doing a whole one woman show, you know, performing eight songs. We did two TV shows. We did one where it was almost like I did little videos roaming around the Victorian set. Um, and then the second one was like a, a live one um, for, I think it was live, if, if I remember rightly, for the audience to choose which song 
they they liked or, or or the viewers to choose so it's quite um it, it it was quite a hard job you know you really didn't have to know what you were doing and know how to sing through eight songs without um i i, I think i sang them live or did i mime i can't re- remember but i believe you mimed oh i mimed <laughs> then it was an easy job i go back <laughs> <laughs> but i still had to perform them all you know all, all of them um you know, it was great. I absolutely loved it. I even had my own parking space at the BBC. I felt very special. How was it to work with Terry Wogan? Terry Wogan was a real laugh, really funny. Because you know how he, he has a sort of love-hate thing with Eurovision. He loves it. He can't bear to miss it. But then he'll criticise everything and put it down, but always in a sort of funny, naughty way. So it was really funny working with a very tongue-in-cheek guy. Um, and it was lovely getting to know him because I, I had actually performed on his uh, Terry Wogan TV show a few times. So I had met him before. So we did know each other, but not very well. But hanging out with him in Ireland and doing all these TV shows, it was just, you know, a, an absolute dream. I know you were first asked by John Black to participate, but initially said, no, no, nope, never. Yeah, I did. Well, you know, I was... An artist, you know, writing my own songs at the time and also uh, performing. And I had my own direction I was going in. And I guess, you know, I loved I love watching uh, Eurovision. And, you know, growing up, we all had parties on, on a Saturday night at my Nana's house. And we'd all, you know, vote for, for the countries and everything. And um, and so, but I remember it really sort of being, you know, boom, bang, a bang, boom, bang, a bang, you know, and very, yeah. very novelty type songs. And which is really the fun of Eurovision in the first place, really. But but I also felt like it wasn't the direction that I should be taking my career in at the time. And, and I was trying to be very sort of arty and cool and, you know, had my sort of direction. So um, so then when I they first asked me, the BBC first asked me, I, I, I straight away said, no, I don't think this is the right thing for my career right now. Um, and then they called me in and Don Black um, sat me down and he was like, um, Don Black sat me down and said, you know, um, we want you to be Britain's sweetheart. You know, of course, I never was. <laughs> <laughs> he, he persuaded me. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, and also, to be honest, though, they did choose some fabulous songs, you know, and um, I didn't have to do any boom, bang, a bangs. Perhaps if I had done a boom bang a bang, I would have actually won. But <laughs> but I have to say it was very much um, set in the style that um, suited me. So so it was lovely. And in fact, I did get um, offered quite a few record deals from it. So it was really nice. And so I ended up going in a studio and writing all the stuff I really wanted to do and putting my own things out in the world, which is, you know, being my creative self. Eight songs competed and you sang them all. Do you still remember them? I remember some of them. I I don't know if I would remember to sing them all now, but I remember um, I remember the one that won. <laughs> <laughs> I do remember. The, um, I just can't remember the names right now, but there were loads of really amazing songs and amazing songwriters that entered. From what I understand, the winning song was also your personal favorite. It was my personal favourite, and people do say that, did I sing that better, but um, did I put it out there better? Um, I don't think I did. I think that, obviously, it was my favourite for a reason, because it was re- really rather brilliant, I think. My heart is broken, my picture is forgotten, but I still believe that I can see a piece of me reflecting in your Besides Lonely Symphony, my personal favourite was the Lion King-esque Sink or Swim. Yeah, that's the one I was thinking. Sink or Swim, that's so good, that one. Yeah. I thought that might win, actually. That was a really good one. Yeah. 
The winning song, Lonely Symphony, written by George DeAngelis and Mark Dean, was chosen by Televotes, and by a big margin it won, and with 30% more than the runner-up. Yeah. To- in total, 249,000 votes were cast, with a population of almost 58 million people in 94. That's not even half a percent of the population. <laughs> I'm so sorry. They obviously didn't like me very much then. No, but I want to... <laughs> was it very expensive to call or were you up against Coronation Street? <laughs> oh, I see. I don't know how these things work, but... I, I mean, is, when it came out, though, it sold lots of singles. Um, way more, like, these days, there, there isn't such a thing, really. But, but yeah, it did quite well. Televoting as early as 94 was impressively forward-thinking, but not a success, apparently. Right, OK. Why don't the UK care about Eurovision as much as we all others do? The rest of us... <laughs> <laughs> I think it's because we always lose. Nowadays, we, yeah. Yeah, we, I think we cared a lot, you know, way, way back, but... We always lose. I think, you know, everybody hates the Brits, basically. <laughs> so we moan too much, I think. That's why. I think that the BBC made a mistake when the host, Terry Wogan, let the two experts for this night, Jonathan King and Richard O'Brien, had to say openly after the song was presented whether it, whether it was good or not before oh, the vote. Yeah, now I remember, yeah. And however, they oh. praise the song Lonely Symphony, but also flat out state that the song has the wrong title and ought to have been named We Are Free. Do you remember this? No. <laughs> I'm probably tearing my hair out backstage, panicking about what words I'd have to remember for the next song. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember them sitting there, but I don't remember a word they said. No. But the title was changed for Eurovision to We Will Be Free with Lonely Symphony in brackets. Yeah. Yeah. Or was it the other way around? Lonely Symphony, We Will Be Free in brackets. I don't know. I can't remember now. Yeah. It makes sense. Later, you released the great album Fragile. Surprisingly, you didn't include any of the songs from the pre-selection except the winner. How come? Oh, that's a good point. Um... I don't know, really. I guess I just, I was going in my direction. I wanted to do the songs I, some of them I wrote and some of them I wanted to sing. I, I'd already worked so hard on, um, on, you know, I'd been working and writing songs and, and finding songs. So I had about 30, 40 songs ready to go. So I guess I chose my favourites, really. Which one of them were your favourites from the album? Blue Eyes The trip went to Ireland, as always, in the 90s. How was Dublin? Dublin was a party city. I remember it was, I had had guards, um, private guards, um, one that sat outside my bedroom door all night and another one. And everywhere I went, I was only allowed to go with them. And so um, I took them along to quite a few clubs. (laughs) I was at that age when I was out enjoying partying. So I had a, there was a party every night. Every country had a party every night. You know, it was it was such good fun. And Dublin was such a friendly city. And it really, you know, that was my first time I'd been to Dublin. So I really, um, really loved it. I went back there many times. Do you remember anything specific? For example, what happened behind the scenes? <laughs> um, anything, you mean like anything naughty or anything sort of crazy? Is that well, what you're asking? Me? Well, well, I asked for uh, some detail. Be a gossip girl. Gossip? Oh no, I I actually don't have any gossip. The um, I can gossip about myself really. Um, and that was that I I was the favourite to win, so I just assumed I was going to. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I was getting ready, you know, because I remember in my head thinking, oh, you can see all those, you know, when you see the and you know the you know deep fois, you know, and and all that. I was thinking, oh my gosh, you know, they're going to be the camera's going to be on me when I get loads of points and. And of course, it never was because I didn't. <laughs> so there you go. That was, I'm just being honest. It was all a bit like disappointing. I think I sank lower and lower and lower and lower. 
um, when when indeed I didn't get many points. Um, although I did come tenth, which isn't too bad for for the Britain I'm told anyway. So um, yeah, so there you go. Um, there's no 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 gossip. I didn't really. Um, I guess I didn't really hang out with anyone more than the people that I was with. I got woken up by the big breakfast, um, Channel Four. That was quite fun. Well, actually, I wasn't. Wo- I, I didn't get woken up. I was already awake, but I was in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> um no 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 gossip really no um was everyone nice to you i think so yeah, yeah. i think think so i don't remember um no and if, if anyone if anyone wasn't i was probably oblivious in my own sort of cloud cuckoo land so no i i, I think i had a good time i mean you know, i loved it i had a great time I was only eight years old when I first saw you perform in the Eurovision. I was totally spellbound by you, oh, es- especially cute. your beautiful voice. And later, I heard that your parents said that you could never be a singer because of your voice. That's right. Um, I I was um, in the back of my mum and dad's car, and I was um, singing along to some song. And I heard them turn around to each other and say, "She really can't sing, can she?" And I and and I did have a husky husky voice. I couldn't get in the school choir. I tried and tried, but I I just couldn't hit those little pretty high notes. So um, I worked on my voice because I, um, I think I was actually. Um, someone said my voice was like a foghorn once, and so um, I worked on my voice myself in my bedroom. And, and I was determined to be a good singer. I think anyone can sing if you really want to. You mean it's possible for me to buy the same cure in any way? <laughs> yeah, I think so. You have to just work at it. I practice every day. From the great year 94, Francis, I have in previous episodes talked to the artists from, oh, hang on now, Sweden, Poland, France, Finland, Ireland, Norway, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and Austria. Wow. This is just a coincidence. I'm not obsessed, I promise. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Do you remember if you had some favorites among the other songs? Um. <laughs> <laughs> you are asking someone to look back. How many years? Oh my gosh. 26. 26 years. And my, I do not have the best memory anyway. Oh gosh, I probably did, but I I honestly can't remember now. So sorry. I'm 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 probably the Eurovision fans are really gonna like put the thumb down on me now. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't remember who you thought was your biggest competitor? No, I thought I was gonna win. I told you. <laughs> <laughs> You uh, were the second favorite according to the betting odds. I checked. Uh, well, sorry, I'm, yeah, oh, someone I checked them today. To me and said I was the favorite. Who was the favorite? Ireland. Oh, they won anyway, didn't they? Yeah. <laughs> Again. <laughs> <laughs> and Germany. Aha. Uh-huh. Okay, I can't think what song that was. Can't even remember the Irish one. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Germany was uh, three girls singing. We're giving a party. Okay. Uh, given that your song maybe wasn't perfectly suited to be performed by a live orchestra, despite its symphonic name, how yeah. well do you think that the orchestra handled it? I think it was pretty good. Yeah, yeah. I think it was it was good. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was a very hard one to do live, but yeah, I was happy. Who was in your team? I mean, who was the backup singers and who were the guitarists? Um, you know, I, I remember Shirley um, was an amazing backup singer. She, she's like, she did a lot of um, people. I had I had amazing musicians and amazing singers, but I, I and we hung out so well at the time. I can't remember anyone's name now. Oh my god! <laughs> I'm so <laughs> <laughs> Your dress was designed by Helen Story. Yes, and we all remember that you were an impressive headpiece. Yeah, tell me about it. 
The headpiece, I just found that in, I think it was in Kensington Market. Oh. Yeah. I don't know where that's gone. I wish I had it now. I'd wear it, actually. Um, and also, Helen Story made a big, big bustle, like an old Victorian-style bustle with a big flag, um, out of a big flag, um, a Union Jack flag, actually. And um, I wasn't allowed to wear it. Why? They didn't feel that I should wear a Union Jack flag. Do you know what? Maybe this was exactly the same dress that Katrina from Katrina and the Waves were offered some years afterwards. Really? Because, That's so yeah. funny. Oh my God. So we had three stylists and they came with three different outfits for me. One was a union flag dress. <laughs> the next looked like a bloody clown suit. <laughs> and the next one looked like, I, I mean, I put it on and I sat down on the couch and the drummer came and he nearly sat on my lap. Because my outfit looked exactly like the couch covering. Just hideous. So another... <laughs> it might yeah. be because I, I didn't... Um, I would have loved to have kept that dress. It was such a beautiful evening gown. But um, I didn't get the opportunity to keep it. They took it took it back. But um, yeah, maybe. It was still around, I guess. The Swedish commentator Pekka Heino wondered if it was a crown of thorns. You were. <laughs> it did look like it was It was shaped like that. It was definitely shaped like thorns, but it was just sort of some cool um, person in Kensington Market that made it and was selling them on stalls. So it wasn't anything really, you know, unique. Unique now, though. By the way, this was not the only fashion report he did during the broadcast. He also said that the Polish contestant Edita Gorniak's dress would be beautiful when it was finished. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Strangely, you only, and I say only because I still think it was madness, you only got a 10th place. Oh, I know. Damn yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> In my opinion, all the ingredients to end up at the top. Meaning? I mean, because you have uh, killer vocals, a big bombastic uh, chorus, and an uplifting message. Oh, it was lovely, wasn't it? Yeah. I'm very proud of that song. Very proud. I, don't, I mean, I'm, I, I, I'm not saying that about my vocals. I'm saying the song, you know. It was a lovely, up, uplifting song. What happened after Eurovision? I mean, what was it like to go back to the UK? Did you feel defeated? I did feel a little defeated, I have to admit. But I you know felt what? <laughs> it was soon forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> Yesterday's news very quickly. How did the media treated you? I think I think everyone was really quite nice. I don't because I didn't I didn't, you know, embarrass the nation or anything, you know, and I think I did a good job and I was professional. So um it's not like some other years where people were singing out of time or off key or something, you know. So I didn't get any I don't think I got bad reviews, but I didn't, I don't have, maybe, maybe I did and I didn't read them. I don't know. But I think it was all, all okay. I think everyone was disappointed that it didn't come further, but, <laughs> but, you know. You have performed in various musicals, released five albums, worked in yes. theatre, won a Tony, worked with television, film, and have a series of five-star sellouts, live shows, both in the UK yeah. and in the US. And during all these years, you gave birth and took care of two children as well. Three. Three children as well. <laughs> yeah. What yeah. did you do with all your spare time? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, I, I don't stop. I'm, I think I'm... Um, uh, my kids say I've, I've got ADD. I don't stop. I'm always doing one thing and another on a project here. And I've just written three plays. I've got one... The one that you're talking about um, uh, that I was doing a one woman show, I, I, I've, I've rewritten it into um, a play called Ruby's Poison. And that's well, that was supposed to be on in New York right now. But sadly, the theatres are closed right now. So hopefully next year that will that will be going on. Yeah. So I'm just, you know, and, and also I'm just right now. I literally uploaded um, today to AWOL, which is a company that then distribute um digital albums so i've just released today um and it's um a 20 minute track just one track and it's um all sort of very very ambient yoga chanting with um it's very cool and it's with another friend of mine called sam and it's two two female vocals with harmonies and everything and that that's going on because i've just also filmed a 20 minute yoga film which is um and i've filmed that with my friend sadie frost 
And basically that means um, you can just watch the film and take in the ambience and listen to the music, or you can join in and do the yoga as well. But it's, it's filmed with four cameras and it's very, it's meant to be very sort of, you know, sensual to, you know, just to make you feel like relaxing or, or happy. You mean that the Eurovision fans now can yoga with Francis Ruffell? Yes. You can do yoga with me and you can listen to the music at the time at the same time. Whoa, yeah. lovely. <laughs> and the um actually what it is, it's um it, it it's a it's a project name that I'm going under called Yin and Tonic. Instead of gin and tonic, it's yin and tonic. And um we've got a website we've just built actually called yin and tonic dot guru. And we've got a YouTube channel which we're hoping to get people to subscribe to and we're gonna constantly put out new films and new yoga routines and new music. And all, all the yoga's free, so anyone who wants to join in with the yoga can do it free. And we'll do we'll do some tutorials as well. So that's what I've been doing because of um, lockdown and everything. Um, you know, I've been creating these every day, and it just felt like a, the right thing to put out. And then there'll be more more of the music will be coming out, and we'll pr- probably drop a new track every month. Yeah. We we must mention here that your daughter is the pop singer Eliza Doolittle, who has a successful music career as well. Yeah, she's amazing. Yeah, I'm very proud of her. Do you have a favorite among her songs? Yeah, I do actually. I like um, Big When I Was Little, um, which wasn't one of the biggest ones, I don't think. But I think it's a great song. I think the lyrics are brilliant and it's really catchy. Right now, she's doing a lot more. Um, she's dropped the, the name Doolittle now. She just goes under Eliza, and she's she's grown up a hell of a lot actually. And she's doing much more R and B, beautiful, sensual, um, very cool music. So you should check out her new music actually. She has dropped the Doolittle, you said. Yes, she has. Yes, because I think that that part of her career is when she's doing all her wonderful pop songs, which I absolutely adored. Um, she grew up really. It's really oddly uh, enough. Um, her stepbrother was very much into R and B, so she grew up really loving R and B. So she's gone back to that. So she wanted to drop Doolittle because it felt like it. It's another phase. So she's in the family with Madonna and Cher now. <laughs> Guess she is actually. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <sighs> Do you know if she has been approached to participate in the contest? I I don't think she ha- has ever been approached. Um, I'm not sure about that. For the big audience, I guess you are still best remembered for starring in Les Miserables. Yes. What are you most proud of in your career? Mm, gosh, I've done so many lovely, lovely things. But um, I think I'm really proud of doing... Um, the PF play that you saw. I think that was one of the biggest challenges for me. Um, apart from the fact I had to sing in French, a lot of it was in French and I don't speak, I'm terrible with languages, so I, I don't speak French. For me, that was, you know, a real sort of hard challenge. I had to sort of work on those words every single day. Um, and also the character herself, she just drives every scene. She's so emotional and funny and brilliant and a car crash of her life. You know, I actually felt at the end of each show and and at the interval, I felt like I'd been in a car crash myself. I actually felt so battered and bruised. It was the biggest challenge of my life, I think, playing that role. No. No regrets No I will have no regrets All the things That went wrong For at last I have learned to be strong Oh no Yeah, do ya No, je ne regrette ne rien is one of the most touching songs ever, and I was deeply impressed with your performance as Edith Piaf. Oh. You were fantastic, Frances. Thank you so much. I, I, I did, I did enjoy it very much. I hope I do it again. 
Please, after this horrible pandemic is over, can you put up that show again? <laughs> I can't just put it up, but I would love to do it. I mean, I, I'm I'm hoping maybe I'll do it in the States. You know, I, I, I usually live in New York at the moment. This is where I'm based in New York. But I came back um, to look after my parents during this time. Yeah. But I will be I'll be traveling back to the States again, probably January or February. Um, but yeah, it would be fun to put it on again, but maybe maybe in the States this time. I know that over 100,000 people brought Paris to a standstill on the occasion of Edith Piaf's death in 1963. I hope the French people will mourn you and me the same way when we go. <laughs> they better, didn't they? <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any special connection to Edith Piaf in particular or to France in general? Yes, I, I do. Um, well, not really, but I, I have it in my head. But basically, um, I mean, when I was a little girl, I, I don't know. I, I France was the only country so I went to. We, we didn't travel much when we were young. We didn't have any money, but we could get to France quite easily from England. So um, we traveled to France a lot. Um, and I always thought with my name, Francis, I must be French, really. Yeah, know? yeah. Um, but actually also the Edith Piaf thing and... and When I was trying to learn to sing French before I actually got the role, um, way before when I was about 17 or something, I, the first French song I learned was an Edith Piaf song. And then when I was auditioning for Les Mis, although I didn't really audition properly, that's another story. But when I was asked to sing for the composers, um, Trevor Nunn, the director, asked me to sing an Edith Piaf song for that role. So I learned a song especially um, for that. So Edith Piaf was very special to me. And I think they they kind of imagined the role of Eponine in Les Miserables as being a sort of little sparrow, a bit, you know, a, a, like an Edith Piaf type singing, an urchin singing on the streets. Yeah. So yes, I, I do feel connected with both France and Edith Piaf. I know you love French chansons as much as I do. Do you have a particular favorite? I like um, Françoise Hardy. Yeah, I love her. I, I, I love a lot of French singers because they, they're all brilliant. And I actually wrote a song which um, in English, which Etienne Daho, Daho, not sure how you pronounce that. Um, he, um, he, he rewrote it in, in French and it was a, a big hit in France. So I am connected as well to Etienne Daho and he came to see my performance in London as well. And then I actually recorded his version of my song in French on one of my albums. <laughs> Le Brasier. Have you tried to compete in Eurovision again or have you got questions <laughs> since 94? No, I haven't and I and I wouldn't because the only thing that is very di difficult for a performer is actually sort of feeling like you're entering into a competition. It's very difficult that part of it um, because when you it's like when I audition for a show or something it's like that's like a competition and it's so hard losing a competition, you know. Um, so I'd rather in I wouldn't I wouldn't want to enter myself into another competition if I didn't have to, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Thank you so much, Frances. This was a delight. Uh, thank you. I think it was fun, yeah? We had fun. I hope to see you again in the future. Yes. And thanks to you, our listeners out there in the world. Don't forget to subscribe on your podcast platform and follow Eurovision Legends on Facebook and Instagram. If you want to contact me, my mail is emaletschlagervannerna.se and you find more information on eurovisionlegends.se. Frances, let's hope for a fantastic 2021. Yes, absolutely. Lovely speaking to you. Lots of love. Yeah.